Let's go. You guys ready? Okay, andiamo. Everything's a brand nowadays, right? Everybody's a brand. Everything's a brand. Every city's a brand. Every country's a brand. I mean, it's ridiculous. So what comes beyond brands? Brands are built on respect, trust, delivery. They do what it says on the can. Good value, good quality, authenticity, heritage. But all successful brands have that now or they don't survive. And you know in Portugal particularly, if you don't have a real compelling proposition, brilliantly executed, there is no wiggle room here. You wither on the vine. The market's too small to fake it, right? So how do you get above that? Well, you have to add something to respect and trust because you don't marry someone that you trust and respect. You marry someone that you trust, you respect, and you love. So brands have got to do that. And we looked at the emotional side of life and said that the brands that had created this magic, this sustainable magic, had three secrets, and that was mystery, sensuality, and intimacy. Brands have got to remember now the stories are all important, and storytelling is not the key. The key now is story sharing. Just as you're trying to do with your conference, I'm sure the speakers all tell stories, but really what's going on is the sharing of those stories behind the, with the delegates, with each other, with the people back at the office when they get home, as they tweet at the conference. It's sharing, and that's what mystery is. I mean, the more you know about something, the less interesting it becomes, right? So you've got to, brands have got to stop deluging us with information and instead inspire us, involve us. Sensuality, brands operate only on one or two senses, but we as humans operate in our life with all five at the same time. We don't turn one or two of them off. It's knowing how consumers feel that represents true intimacy. Brands have to be transparent, and they have to say, hmm, got that wrong, really sorry, we fixed it. Apple's a great example of that. So are Google. You know, these guys get everything wrong first time up. They say sorry, they fix it. You know, Tom Peters talks about it. It's fail fast, learn fast, fix fast. And as long as you fix fast and you're open, the people will go, yeah, fair enough. Okay, I'm back in. So you don't beg for love. You don't demand love like some politicians do. You have to earn it. And brands have to earn that love. And it's a journey, you know, and it's constantly changing. You know, you have to be earning that with consumers every day. You have to become part of their lives. The most important thing brands have to do now is to realize that they are no longer in control of their brand. They have to give up ownership of that brand to the people because the people today have all, have all the power. Great. So the brands that are in the emotional high ground that have built loyalty beyond reason, beyond price, beyond value. Brands like Singapore Airlines, brands like Emirates, brands like Manchester City Football Club, brands like Apple for, for many people. You know, you can buy a Samsung or you can buy a product from Microsoft that functionally does everything Apple do, but would you? I mean, 70 odd percent of people go for Apple, not because it's a better product, but because it's irresistible they they love it wake me up wake me up before you go it's a wonderful time to be alive because the rules are all broken right i mean it's all like come on just i'm ready to play with you i'm ready to engage with you if you engage with me and play with me right the, the people are out there we can build intimacy in ways we don't need mass media we don't need big mass campaigns we don't need big money now all we need is an idea. We live in the age of the idea. Every morning you should recite your ABCs. Ambition, belief, and courage. Ambition, belief, and courage. And I first learned that from a 
England rugby coach called Brian Ashton, and we use it in business all the time. You've got to have great ambition to, to succeed and to delight customers. You've got to have the belief that you can do that. And then the courage to keep the ideas alive because ideas are the most precious, vulnerable things. You know, wherever you work, you will always meet the abominable no man. And he will try and kill your idea and strangle it. So you need real courage to keep the ideas alive. I've always played team sports, and, and I think, you know, from soccer to cricket uh, to rugby, you know, the game they play in heaven. And those sports teach you all kinds of connectivity into personal stuff, but most of all, they teach you leadership. That the role of the leader is simply to create other leaders. That winning isn't everything. The idea that you're born leader is just folly. Of course, a Gandhi is a Gandhi and a Mandela is a Mandela, but I'm not talking about that level. Leadership is a skill, it's a science and an art. And we can learn to become better leaders. We can learn from people like Jack Welsh. We can learn from those around us. We can learn, I mean, I had a two hour meeting with Shimon Perez talking all about leadership. Colin Powell talks a lot about leadership. Jeff Bezos, like it or love it at Amazon, this guy's got some very strong leadership principles that when you talk, take away the intensity and the hard work, they're pretty sound and they work. I think you can encourage leadership, you can nurture it on a field or in an office or in an environment. So I think, yes, it can be taught and it should be taught. Creative leaders, I think, are people who can create a climate where there's lots and lots of ideas. I'm not a big believer in the next big idea. I'm a believer in a culture that generates lots and lots of small ideas as a way of life and then serendipity or the competition or consumers or something gives a bit of fuel to this one of the ideas and you see it and you get involved with it and you engage with it and you and all of a sudden you've got your big idea right there without even knowing you know when you started one of us is never as good as all of us Great teams are built on belief and in confidence in everybody around you. And now it's about, boy, let's go forward with enthusiasm, with optimism. Let's all go forward together, build off each other. Don't get me wrong, though, you still need great players. You know, I mean, no matter how many good players you have, 10 of them won't make up for one great one. So you need to be looking for greatness in these guys. But greatness can come from the collective. They all, you know, if the leader can inspire everyone to be the best they can be, that team dynamic will then add 20% as well, in my experience. Knowledge, skills, and attitude. You've got to have people with a lot of knowledge with great skills, but you've got to have positive, go forward, brave attitude. I've only ever written one equation in my life, right? One. And this equation is, is what I think drives a successful company. IQ plus EQ plus TQ plus BQ. IQ, intelligence quotient, knowledge. You cannot hire Muppets. It's too competitive. People are well-educated now wherever they live, either at university or in the university of life, but you've got to get smart people. And by that, I mean people who can learn real fast who can absorb real fast, are hungry for knowledge. So you've got to have IIQ. You cannot maintain average players, good players. You won't win like that. You've got to have very, very bright, sharp players. EQ, you have to have a diverse team that feels empathy for the rhythm, the flow of the market, the country, and the people. So you need black, white, brown, pink, male, female, transsexual, gay, straight, I don't, short, small, young, old. You've got to have diversity because that's going to give you more empathy with the world. So high EQ. TQ, obviously, technology quotient, you cannot fake it. Most companies are faking it. They're very slow, stuff doesn't work. It's not, 
It's maybe collecting data, but they're not really interpreting data. So you've got to have IQ, EQ, TQ, and BQ bloody quick. So you've got to be prepared. You've got to put the hard yards in. You've got to do the training. You've got to do the studying. You've got to build the IQ. You've got to have your IQ muscle on the go. Then you've got to put yourselves in situations where EQ and the BQ will help. And as long as you keep going, given that I am a radical optimist, something's going to break for you, you know? But you've got to, put your, you've got to do what the All Blacks say, which is go for the gap. Don't go for the man. Don't play the man. Don't go straight into the norm. Don't go straight into what's being done and try and make it better. I mean, if you're going to do a startup, just don't make a better product. Make a completely different product, right? You've got to disrupt, disrupt, disrupt. What keeps you awake at night? Have you ever asked that question? Yeah, and, all right. yeah well, nothing keeps me awake. I go to sleep. Like, I'm tired. You know, so I go to sleep, I wake up next morning, I get to work, so nothing keeps me awake at night, right? And the other thing is, oh, it must be tough at the top, and I'm going, wow, you must be crazy. It's very tough at the bottom, almost impossible in the middle. The top's the easiest thing in the world. The easiest, because you're surrounding yourself with fantastic people. You're in, presumably, a business that you love and that you understand inherently, right? And it's, it's, just, a, it's just a joy. I mean, I started life very poor, you know, like, like many people working class, and so I got kicked out of school when I was less than 17, so it was kind of shocking and had to, you know, get four jobs simultaneously. One of the reasons why I own a pub now is one of my jobs was working in a bar, the Lancastrian pub at night, and I thought, wow, this is pretty good, but I'm not making all the money I should be making out here anyway. And I've been poor, and now I'm rich. Being rich is just so much better. It's just better, you know, and then you can help people and then you can do something and you have resources and you have connections and you can try and make the world a better place. These kids aged 17 to 20, you know what? They need life experience. They need to get away from home. So yes, they need to learn whatever it is that they're thinking about studying, but most importantly, they need to learn to live, to survive, to make friends, to make choices, to make a budget, to make ends meet. And at 17 to 20, they're not really that employable, are they? Because they don't have scar tissue yet, they haven't traveled. I think the ideal world is get yourself into a university that's a long way from home, probably has a really good social life, has a broad view of arts and sciences, lets you do a lot of other subjects besides just your major, so you get broader. Probably has a year involved in some travel someplace, so you can get, and I don't mean just to Paris or Milan, I mean go to Kenya or you know go into deep Thailand or something. And it has that whole thing set up. Place where you get exposed during that study to some outside sports teams, companies or whatever. Come back out of there 22, 23 and do seven different things before you're 30. Don't stay anywhere for longer than nine months. Man, move, get out and keep growing, keep growing, keep growing, keep going, man. New experiences, new experience. Then at the age of 29 and 30, figure out what it is that's turning you on, figure out what's making you happy, make happy choices, and what you're really good at. One of the kids at Cambridge last week, he said, uh, I want to um, go travel for a year. What do you think I should do before I go? And I said, go on a bartending course, because wherever you go in the world, you know, you don't need a work permit, you don't need to fill any papers in, and everybody needs a proficient bartender. Just learn six cocktails and how to pull the perfect beer. Great. Yeah, that was called a burning platform, right? I had a baby and uh, no money and no, no prospects, so you, you, know, you sort of had to, had to go to work to pay the rent. Yeah, so it's not a route that I would recommend. <laughs> I've got a great daughter. <laughs> this was the 60s, you know, and it was boom time and there was growth and it was creative. And I was from the northwest of England, which at that time was the home of sport, the home of music, the Beatles and so on, the home of art, you know, David Hockney and all this kind of stuff. And I was lucky enough to to walk into Mary Quant at, 
in a fashion business in, in London that was booming and, and then was lucky enough to catch the eye of Gillette, a big corporation, persuaded Procter & Gamble that they should hire me, which was like my university education, you know, working for Procter & Gamble. But that's a road less traveled and I, and I think, uh, you know, when you're desperate, you have no choice. I mean, I was driven to succeed and I was driven to be the best I could be. And I was driven like that from when I was three. Right? And I loved leading teams and captaining teams and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, those times are different now. I work at Magdalen College in Cambridge and the master is Rowan Williams, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury. And, and I had a private dinner with him about a year or so ago and we're talking about Leadership in a philosophical way. He's a grammar school boy from Swansea, likes a glass of red wine, plays rugby, and uh, was also pretty close to the big boss God as the Archbishop of Canterbury. He was, there wasn't a lot of hierarchy between him and him, I don't think. Anyway, and I say to him, man, how can you, when you look around the world and you see the bad things people are doing and the things that they say and, 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 and you have to deal with it all and the media and all this, how do you stay so such a beautiful person, because he's a beautiful man. And he says, well, every time, every morning I wake up, you know, he doesn't shave, he's got this big beard, I wake up and I look at the mirror and I just think, well, what would God think? And that's what he thinks. And that's not like fundamentalist or extreme. It's just a reminding question, you know, what? What would God think and what would he try and do about this to make, to make things better? And uh, I think if you have a philosophy, wh whichever religion you are, because, you know, as, as Anglicans, we're, you know, I mean, we're very um, tolerant. You just, just say you're sorry and you do better and you're good to go, you know, it's terrific. And so, you know, I mean, I've studied Buddhism and Islam and Hinduism and obviously Catholic, Catholicism and so on and so forth. And I think they're much closer than they are distant and separate, so I'm not radical or fundamental at all. I'm so middle of the road. I just think whoever you are, if you have a spiritual uh, set of values, might make you happier if you have that framework to think about the way Rowan does. My sister left England on this assisted passage where for 10 pounds you could sail to New Zealand and live there. She was only 16, and she did that. And she went there and she said, this is great, you've got to come here. It's like egalitarian. There's a difference between egalitarian and socialist, okay? So it's egalitarian. People don't care where you came from, where you went to school, nothing. Just they care about who you are and what you're doing. That, that's all they care about. I love everything about the size. It's only four million people. That we know everybody. The standards, because we want to be the best at everything, even though we're small. Team New Zealand, the America's Cup, the All Blacks, Peter Jackson, Lord of the Rings, were not constrained by fear or by comfort. We live on the edge of the world. The dream that we have for New Zealand is to win the world from the edge. I mean, my dream is to make the world a better place through business, because I understand business. And what I mean by business is not fancy fin financial manipulations and hedge funds. I don't mean making money. Okay, I really think it's about uh, creating jobs. We, the capitalists, have to stimulate growth and to create jobs to get the global economy working, yes, but to get the global social situation working. You have one life, right? It's not a dress rehearsal, here we are. So are you gonna be happy? Are you gonna love doing still things? Are you gonna have, be full of joie de vivre, full of enthusiasm? Or are you going to be oppressed and negative and cynical and contrarian? So I'm on the a radical optimist. First, make happy choices, right? And these millennials are really doing that, I think, because they're very connected, they're very creative, they're very collaborative, they are in a really great space, I think. And I, and, and I think they're doing a wonderful job with what they've got. And they are making happy choices. I think that's really good. I think another thing that they should think about is start with the answer and work back. So get yourself a personal purpose. Figure out what your five-year, 10-year dream looks like and write it down. Figure out when you're at your best and put yourself into positions where you'll always be at that. 
and figure out what you're never going to do, what you will never do. Figure those three things out. Have a personal purpose. And then the final thing I would suggest them is they have to learn to live life slow. And that does not mean to say no energy, do fewer things. It means don't bother about worry, guilt, regret. These things, discard them. Don't worry about the future. Live life slow. Live life in the moment. Make every experience today the best it can be. So don't look for balance. Avoid moderation, right? Nothing succeeds like excess. And again, I think these millennials are really, they're struggling with that because they think multitasking is a way of life. And it's a huge mistake because they're doing everything averagely. So whilst I think they're doing a wonderful job of making happy choices, I think my advice would be try to live life slow, be more in the moment, live that moment with full focus rather than distractions. The critical thing for me is to make happy choices. I only want to do stuff that I can really make a difference in, really have an impact in, and that really makes me happy. But I won't do a single thing now that doesn't bring happiness. Thank you very much.